Live from Las Vegas, Nevada, extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube covering Informatica World 2015. Brought to you by Informatica World. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live at Informatica World 2015. This is the Cube Silicon Angles flagship program where we go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angle. Join my co-host, George Gilbert, our new Wikibon, big data analyst, just new on the scene, uh, taking over the helm from Jeff Kelly. Um, and our next is Anil Chakravarti, who's the EVP and Chief Product Officer of Informatica. Great title, we love the product guys. because now, now we can get down and dirty in the product. So, Absolutely. welcome back to theCUBE. My pleasure, thank you for having me. We had a great chat at Amazon reInvent, um, Past event we, we were did, out there. Yeah, great, indeed. great chat. Cloud is changing the game. Yep. Data now is obviously rising up, mm -hmm. and all CIOs, CDOs, CXOs are all mindful of the fact that data is not just an operational cost; Correct. it's an opportunity to drive revenue and growth. Um, what do you guys have on the product that align with that vision? And what are some of the customers you guys have right now that you're working with? Yeah, you know, we call what we do as the, the vision, our vision as the intelligent data platform. And we the, see a, uh, the world evolving exactly like you laid out. If you think of, you know, 10 years ago, data and applications were very closely integrated together, very closely tied together. Now, the data architecture and the application architecture are going in separate directions, obviously aligned and integrated, but data, people realize that data lives on for way longer than even the applications do. And so they also realize that data, their data is both on-premise as well as in the cloud. And so they need to be able to address data. So the intelligent data platform is all about that, the new way of managing your data. I was talking to a customer last night and I was saying to him, and I was talking with one of our, our colleagues, I'm like, has a customer ever said to you, I need less compute power? And th with the cloud, where you mentioned at Amazon and these new resources, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud, compute is becoming more and more available. Exactly. Which enables more data analysis, whether that's for security purposes or and or for other value. So as compute and as resources become uh, infinite, if you will, I mean, infinite, so to speak, data has to be frictionless. That's correct. How do you guys enable that? Because that is a big problem. Customers have these islands of data or ponds of data, whatever you want to call it. They want to put them into an ocean or a lake, or whatever metaphor. This is a huge challenge. What do you guys see for that piece of the product? We look at it from the customer's perspective and say, what are they trying to do with this data? Enterprise customers, if you think of their data-driven business initiatives, we look at it as five primary buckets. This, is, this captures you know, the bulk of what our customers do with our data. Analytics is a big one, application consolidation, getting a 360 degree view of their customers, cloud modernization, data governance. Those are the five big things that they do with our data. And we structure a lot of our technologies and solutions around those five areas. And how do you guys do it? Because in the old days, you had a one trick pony product, not you guys, but a vendor, oh, here's my general purpose solution, and then sell it around. But in, with data, Use cases differ by client, by industry. There's a lot of dimensions, even amongst the data itself and the customers. Yeah. So how do you build a platform? Is it, do you guys architect it differently? Is there certain technologies you guys rely on? Can you share some color on that? Yeah, you know, the good thing about that one trick pony, as you called it, was it was actually built with an architecture that was actually foldable. And that's the, the core component of what we call the intelligent data platform. That engine, which we call as Vibe, which is the engine that actually is portable across multiple platforms, helps you do data processing across your, across on-premise, in the cloud, on Hadoop, et cetera. That's the foundation. On top of that, we call it the data infrastructure, where there are certain core components that are integrated together. Data integration, data quality, data mastering, data security, these are all integrated together in the data infrastructure layer. And then, as you saw at the show, we're really investing a lot in what we call data intelligence because as the volume of data grows exponentially, unless you know more about your data, where is it located, is it sensitive or not, what is the quality of the data, what is the yeah. trustworthiness of the data, if you don't have that metadata, you cannot be successful with your data, and that's the other layer we're investing in. So the way we think of bringing all of this together is this intelligent data platform, which has these three key layers. Talk about the metadata, because that's really a big thing I want to unpack. You know, last week at, uh, at EMC World, we had theCUBE there, and I asked the uh, head of Extreme IO, the new big rockin' product in EMC, 
what are the three conversations you're involved in the most? He goes, metadata, metadata, and metadata. Mm -hmm. That's a big part of how the brains are being formed in this fabric is met having metadata available, always around the data. How do you guys see that evolving naturally? I mean, is there a certain technology? I mean, metadata describes data. Right. And so if I'm integrating disparate data sets, I need access to all the metadata. That's right. Now, metadata is, it's also easy to get confused about metadata, so let me just explain what we mean by metadata. Okay. What we mean by metadata is, as you said, data about data, but the data is really about what types of data, what quantities of data, and where it's resident. So it's in, in effect, it's looking inside the data store. If you look at it from the viewpoint of an infrastructure company like EMC, for them, metadata would mean more about file sizes and uh, other things at the infrastructure level. For us, it's at the data level. So if you have a big database table with a million records, for example, we would know what columns you're referring to and what those columns actually contain. So that's the data that we are building on. Exactly as you said, having visibility to that, you then have to be very careful about how you use that metadata. You don't need to actually expose everybody to that metadata. You need to know what to use it for and how to use it. And that's what we're building with the live data map. There's a trade-off involved where you have all this intelligence it's almost like a sort of Grand Central Station, you know, where you know who's coming and going and everything about the schedules. Correct. But when you have this sort of frictionless flow of data where you sort of crack the data loose of all the applications, as you're constantly expanding the data systems um, and, the, and the applications, there's a trade-off where if you put the intelligence at the edges, um, you have a potentially more agile way of adding new sources and targets, whereas if you put it in the center, it's maybe more waterfall, you, everyone has to agree on changes. Is that, is, is that a fair characterization? Yeah, I think actually the best way to understand how live, live data map works is it is a federated architecture. In other words, for example, let's say you have a product like the Intelligent Data Lake, uh, Project Sonoma, using, pro the, um, uh, using metadata. Yeah. It does not depend upon the central metadata source. It has a metadata that it is gathering, but the key thing is it's in the same format. It is shareable with metadata from the other sources. So in other words, to address your question, if it's not all dependent on a central single instance of metadata, metadata okay. is still embedded within those products, but the format is shareable, discoverable, searchable across all these products. So when you find something that you find contextual data that you want to use in your analytics and it's repeatable, it's easy to connect. And it's easy to share it with that federated repository. Okay. Exactly. exactly. Okay. So I got to ask about this data lake thing that's been kicked around. People know that I'm not a big fan of data lake. I like data ocean better because it's more currents, more flows, different kind of diversity. But data lake, I get that. It's a marketing term. People have been yeah. using it to, to show how you combine data and it helps people get to the journey. But one of the things that's come up here that I want to get your take on is most people have a data swamp. They jam everything in too, too fast into this big pool or, or uh, data, and there's bad data quality. Yeah. And what they want to get to is an intelligent lake or Correct. robust, whatever you want to call it, but they have swamps instead. So how do you guys get a customer from a swamp yeah. <laughs> to a lake, intelligent data lake? Yeah, and let, let me just add, when you also in the context of if they're evaluating some of the other data wrangling tools, you know, where it's the self-service, let me explore this swamp. Yeah. So the both alternatives. So that's what, that's exactly what Project Sonoma addresses, is we believe to have a, a, a data, whatever you want to call it, a data reservoir or something more refined, not a data swamp. There are a couple of ways of doing it and you need, as a tool, we want to support all of them. One way of doing it is to have trusted people put data into it, who have already pre-checked the data. That's what we call curated data. So for example, yeah. you're looking at data about revenue, there's no argument about which data about revenue is accurate or not. IT knows which data sources are accurate, systems of record, and they pre-populate the data. So that's one way of making sure the data that is in there is high quality. The second way is collaborative, where you say, look, just like you know, when you go shopping on eBay or Amazon, for example, you look at ratings. There are people who have very high ratings because they have been, they have been trusted buyers or sellers. Same thing with trusted users of data. And if it's a trusted user, any data they contribute 
is of a higher quality. And those are some of the methods that we're using to make sure that the data in there is actually of high quality. So I got to go to the next step on that, which is, okay, <laughs> the CEO and chairman was up on stage saying, the age of engagement. Correct. So now let's take that to the engagement. What is the engagement piece of that puzzle? Is that the actual trusted uh, gesture data? Or what, what does that mean? What does that mean, a engagement data? For the you? engagement data essentially means that, uh, let me use this as an example to clarify it. You know, if you went to an ATM machine, say 10 years ago, what did the ATM machine record? It only recorded basically your transactions in the timestamp. You, you know, you made a transfer or you yeah. made a credit or debit, that was it. Today you go to the same ATM machine, what's it recording? What it is recording, for example, is if it's a touch screen, it's recording your touch. If there's a camera, the camera is recording your actual presence and what you do, et cetera, for other potential uses. Those extra things that it's actually that are being stored, that's what we mean by the age of engagement. It is not the actual transaction data, that's obviously being recorded. It's all the other interaction that you're having. For example, if you have a mobile app and you show up at an ATM, with this, uh, the company knows that, hey, he's, he's a mobile banking customer who is at this ATM. Why is he at the ATM? Maybe there's something in the mobile app he could not do. Those are the kinds of things that we call the age of engagement. So talk about the um, dynamic. First of all, you, I want to congratulate you guys doing a great job with the product. The messaging here is great. And you know, we were talking earlier about how, you know, data- energy at the show, huh? The, uh, tons of energy. I mean, the lunchroom's packed, not even a seat to have, you know, I mean, it's just, it's a lot of energy. You know, plus great hotel. But they, your message of bringing the data up, okay, call it a data lake or whatever, is, is a good good message. So how do you guys take it to the next level? Okay, mm -hmm. so that assumes, okay, now data is accessible. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you guys take it into the next generation w in two dimensions? Data at rest and yeah. data in motion. Yeah. And this goes back to my data ocean analogy. But like, I got a lot of motion going on, a lot of fast data, real time. Then I got data at rest. Correct. How do I make that accessible for all applications and for the entire network? The main aspects of that is, first of all, accessibility. Accessibility is one, how do I get access to it and how do I move it? So for example, data that's moving, being, that's at a very high streaming rate is not ingested the same way as batch data. So we have multiple types of ingestion mechanisms to make all data accessible. Second key piece is who has access to the data? If it's a lake, if it's a free for all, it's going to be a, a governance nightmare. So how do you make sure that whatever security controls were in place at the original source of the data can continue to be used in the lake. Otherwise, for example, you're all just opening up access of all data to everybody. So that's accessibility is a key aspect of it. The second piece, which you said, which covers the data at motion, what we think of it as sort of essentially data in flux, which is there's a project being worked on in the demo that you saw of Project Sonoma, for example, you could see that analysts can create their own projects. Any data that's in a project is essentially data at motion because they have not yet finalized the data. They are tweaking it, they're blending it, they're Working using with it. it. Yeah, they're playing with it, they're analyzing when it. When they're done, they get to publish it. When it gets published, it becomes data at rest that other people can use. If it's in an active project, it's data in motion. And that's how we handle the difference. It's super exciting. I mean, I wrote a blog post in 2008. I said, data is the new development kit and kind of riffing mm -hmm. on the notion that the old days of developers, you have a development kit and you get some source code. What you're referring to now is data is now being acted on. Correct. As a resource in the development process, whether it's a business user. That's right. Or a developer. Exactly. And being shared, it's being shared, it's collaborative, and it's a way of making sure that you get, you, you get, you know, it's a s simple way of thinking about it. In the past, when you needed to, for example, get a document typed up, you went to a typist pool. That typist pool is gone now. It's all yeah. self-service. How do you do the same thing with analytics? Where do you go to a central uh, department to do analytics for you? You won't. Soon, you'll, every user will be able to do their own, but it is with trusted data that they get from trusted sources. Following on that, we've been talking to customers like Bloomberg, JP Morgan Chase, Credit Suisse, and they're saying along those lines, um, it's not just SaaS apps, you know, the sort of business process efficiency apps, but analytic apps where they take what used to be a data feed from a provider mm -hmm. and they might want to push it, push the analytics on Bloomberg. So Bloomberg is responsible for integrating all the data feeds and um, the bank might be updating the analytics, but that the integration is done, you know, just once in a provider. Is that a direction you see that's actually, in fact, we acquired a company called StrikeIron, which provides data as a service for exactly that reason. Now, 
data, as an example, if you're an insurance company, you're trying to understand your white space. You got your own internal data of which products you sold to which customers, and that might come from five or six different systems. Then you go outside to a third party and you get a lot of household data. What are all the households in the United States? And what is always them? adding more. Yeah, and you get, some of these could be real time, some of these could be one time batch feeds. And then you get to put, put all of that together. A lot of that type of data, those data feeds, are, we make that possible. We work with any data feeds that come automatically through like a Bloomberg, for example. But we can also help customers initiate their own data feeds of very specific data that they need for their analytics. Okay. That's true. So what's next on the roadmap? Give us a taste of what's on, what's coming around the corner. I mean, you're a public company now, but still um, high level directionally from this event. Yeah. You know, what's your objectives? I mean, you're going to go back and you're going to keep on working and certainly when you go private it's going to be nice to have you know some privacy around you know <laughs> retooling but what's what's next you know four big areas we're concentrating on um, one is the cloud where for us it basically means any kind of cloud deployment hybrid cloud on prem um, all in the cloud etc cloud can, is a big area of focus second area of focus is around the next generation of analytics this model of how to make it completely self service and collaborative analytics but with trusted data the third one is master data. You know, master data is one of the, our crown jewels. And in the world of big data, the data swamp, data ocean that you talked about, for data to be useful, it has to be anchored to real master data. And that's a key area we're focusing on. And the fourth area is data security. So all four areas are active investment areas for us. What would you say about the security piece? As we've got a minute or two left. You know, security is obviously big, big data driven now. Anywhere you go, you see that impact. Yep. What's the do-over in security right now? I mean, security is upside down. We kind of recognize that. Um, what's what do companies do for security? What's the big do-over? Well, what's they have the to just start looking at protecting what really they care about, which typically tends to be the data. So, what we've had so far are security tools that kind of protect the data indirectly, you know, through network security, et cetera, et cetera. And clearly, for a lot of customers, that is not proving to be sufficient. So they just start to do both. They have to keep those kinds of network security tools, et cetera, uh, active. At the same time, they have to just go in and start understanding their data models and say, where is my critical data? If I care about social security numbers, credit card numbers, account numbers, policy numbers, yeah. whatever you may have, where is it, first of all? Where is it? How, is it protected today where it is? Who else has it? Is yeah. it being copied? Is it being shared? Is it being put into a data lake? where everybody has access to it, maybe even contractors and yeah, outsiders. Yeah. So that, that's the mindset they need. The I mean, this is going to fall on your shoulders when the, when they had a perimeter, the data guys in the, oh, the perimeter's got everything secure, but once this bro breach, now it's no perimeter. Exactly. It's on you now. Exactly. So, so the, the, the people responsible for the data have to look at it from a data perspective. So you guys have concepts like geodata, like knowing where the data is, find my iPhone kind of concept, where it's like, yeah, yeah, find my iPhone. Yeah. And data moves around so much, that's, you must have tracking. That's what data discovery is all about. You know, the metadata that we use helps us discover the data. So it says, look, here are these thousand data databases in which you have personally identifiable information. So and you guys build security in from day one into the into your platform? Well, the, that is... For the data. That's one key piece of it. It's one, keeping our products secure, but then using the metadata from our products to make security better for our customers. This is where I think the signaling... So let's just share this with your thoughts on this, because to me, I would think that the signaling of the data, using yeah. big data, like, hey, someone's accessing that data out here. Correct is a notification opportunity, maybe a small data point. Correct. But in the bigger picture, could be a signal. That's correct, exactly. And that's where security is all about detecting anomalous behavior. You know, because if you, if you can identify what's normal, and then anything that's abnormal, you got to go track down and see what's really going on. Easy to say, very hard to do, but that's where we're getting to. That's a new type of application. That's the system of intelligence on top of that. That's exactly right. It comes from the data intelligence layer. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Anil, that's awesome. Thanks for joining us and sharing your insights. I know you're super busy. Congratulations on the great show. Thank you. Um, My pleasure. And thanks for having me on the show. Uh, on, I, I love being on the Cube, and hopefully we'll run into each other soon. We love having you on. You're a tech athlete. Anil here, SVP, EVP. Chief Product Officer, always talk with product guys to find out what's going on. That's why <laughs> I have my philosophy on the Cube. We'll be right back after this short break.